you're on. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much for the for the introduction. So I'm going to talk about joint likelihood deconvolution of astronomical images with plasma noise. There are many, uh, many things in there. So there are aspects of statistics, so joint likelihoods. There's a problem of deconvolution, so the problem of sharpening images and deep learning images. And specifically, we're going to apply this to astronomical images, and even more specifically to astronomical images with, with plasma noise. So here's just a short overview on X-ray or gamma ray astronomy, just for the stats students. Um, I mean, there are many, many things to talk about, um, but we are astronomers and we're interested in like, okay, what does the sky look like? So we're observing the sky in multiple wavelengths. So people started, of course, in the optical and then they um, extended it to other wavelengths. And the range that we're mostly talking about, which is dominated by the process statistics, is the X-ray and gamma ray range. So this is what the sky roughly looks like in the gamma ray. So this is images taken by an Fermilat satellite and you can see that there's a lot of structures and this is like the Milky Way. There are things like active galactic nuclei and there's galactic diffuse emission. There are these um, amazing structures, the so-called Fermi bubbles, which extend above and beyond the galactic plane in gamma rays. Um, this is an image in, in X-rays. This is taken by the Eurocita satellite. Um, and again, you can see that like, there's a lot of structure um, to be seen and to be understood that, that we're interested in. I think what's important really is the brightnesses and fluxes in X-ray and gamma ray range are really, really low. So what we're doing here, in fact, is we are detecting single photon events. And this is the kind of data that we have to deal with. So this typically requires like large detection areas or just like long exposures. So for example, this Fermi image here is an exposure time of like 10 years. I don't really know about the euros, if I'm wrong. So if you kill a second, sorry, must be wrong. Yeah, maybe something, something like this. There are also other observatories. So in the gamma ray range, there's HES, Hawk, CTA, and you can search for those, or even X rays. There's obviously Chandra, XLM, New Star. So how does the imaging process in this regime work in a little bit more detail? So we have some true flux distributions. So this is just like how the world is or how the, the structure is in the um, in the universe, let's say. Then we're observing this with some instrument, but this instrument or telescope has a limited angular resolution. This is usually quantified by a thing called the point spread function. So this is the, the shape of what a point source would look like. And um, point source in astronomy are real things. So those are typically objects that are very far away. Um, this means you can already have, or you already have a rough idea of, of what the point switch function looks like. But after, so if this is the true distribution and after you've watched it through this instrument, then it's blurred. Um, this is just what's, what's happening. And in addition, you have these additional exposure times. So you have, for example, pointing instruments and telescopes. So they, they point to the sky for a certain amount of time then they collect all the photons. This is called one observation. Um, and then you do this at another, on another day. Um, and you get a second exposure, for example. Um, but this might have a different, different length. So you have like very uneven exposure times. And this, in addition, comes with all with, with plasma noise. And this means like the actual data that you work with looks more something like this. So you go from this true flux distribution here to what's called a counts image. So for each pixel in the image, you really count the number of photons that come from this direction corresponding to the, to the image. This is what we call this counts image. Uh, but you can see like a lot of information was lost in this process, um, first on the angular resolution and also by the other models. However, if we actually know the PSF, then we can try to reconstruct some of this information. And this is what I would call uh, the, the unblind deconvolution problem. So the idea is really to undo this imprint of the instrument on the on the data using some method or statistical approach to do this. The information that we put in is the point spread function and an estimate of the uh, of the exposure, and then we might have some chance of reconstructing this original image. Um, I've put in this additional idea of what I call the joint deconvolution. 
And this is based on the fact that typically for a given region of the sky, we have multiple observations. So not only one instrument or telescope to look at this region, but multiple telescopes. Do. What's special about this is that the point split function of the telescopes that are used are very different, for example. Um, I'll talk about this a, a little bit, bit later, but the idea is now really you have multiple observations and you can actually make use of all the data at the same time and reconstruct a single flux image corresponding to this true true bond in the in the process. Okay, how do we do this? Um, I'll talk just a little bit about about math. So the idea is really to handle or to handle this as a regression problem. So we're trying to come up with a model for the for the detector. Part of this is the point spread function. And part of this is also the exposure. Part of this is the, the assumption on the um, on the Poisson, Poisson likelihood that we have. And if we do this, then we can actually compute for each count in the image with each pixel, we compute the Poisson likelihood. We can take the product across all pixels, can take the log, and then we end up with this uh, negative log likelihood term in astronomy. This is often called the cache statistics. And um, like statisticians probably have a different term for this. Um, but it's just like the Poisson log likelihood per pixel, and we sum, sum it up across all pixels. The question is how to get this mean here of the of the Poisson. And for this, you have what I would call a forward model. So you have this true underlying flux distribution, which is X. Typically, you convolve this then with the PSF of the instrument to get an estimate of what the predicted counts would look like. And you also factor in the exposure, which I've not shown, shown here, but this is just, just a detail. Now we can actually treat each pixel in the image as an independent parameter and just say, okay, I have a negative log likelihood function, I can just optimize and get an estimate of what the underlying flux image looks like. The first proposal how to solve this um, is actually already 40, no, 50 years old. So proposed by Richards and Lucy. Um, and they came up with an expectation maximization algorithm for this. Um, and this has worked very well for, for a long time. Um, however, I'd like to show you a quick problem with this. Um, so this is my face, an example image in the fossil noise. And if I do this, reconstruct this with Richards and Lucy. Yes. Yeah, just in, remind me once again what the PCA function does. So what does yes. it take as in? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so the question was what this PSF function does. Yeah. So this is probably a bit of astronomy jargon. It's called the point spread function. Um, I mean, there are similar concepts in physics and statistics. Um, so this represents the response of a linear system to a point signal or a delta function. Um, in the case of an imaging system, a point or like the uh, delta function would be just a single bright pixel. And the PSF makes like a blurred or Gaussian, typically Gaussian shaped thing. Mm -hmm. of, of so what does it take as an image, like a matrix or? It would take typically an image. Okay. And then your predicted signal is given by this um, true, um, um, by, by this delta peak. And then it's just forward folder or convolved with the, with the PSF and would end up with this signal here. Um, by image, you mean like, for example, like we represent image in a computer sense. Like yes. Yeah, exactly. Two dimensional matrix. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And the delta function would correspond to like a single, like all everything is set to zero, but a single pixel the would be set to one. And this is your, your delta function. Yeah. Just, just to um, elaborate on that, uh, the way it is used here is indeed as matrices, matrix uh, convolution. Um, uh, but in principle, it doesn't have to be. Uh, the original data are lists of locations of where the photons are. And the PSF basically represents the probability that a photon coming in from one direction ends up in another direction. So you can always make that kind of uh, assignment uh, with any sort of replicator. I mean, so not any. Indeed, you can also interpret it as probability distribution. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like highest in the, I don't know, it's highest in the two directions that the photon was coming in from. Yes. You, usually, not always. Usually, usually, yes. Yeah. There, there's somewhat like pathological yeah. PSFs as well um, that have like side lobes and you would get peaks here and here and here. Mm -hmm. um, but this is not typical for these kind of instruments that we're looking at, but it's more, for example, radio astronomy, very, very weird looking 
physics. Actually, even Chandra, Chandra uh, here said we were far and more biases. Yes, that is It's a perfect damage. Yeah. That will keep that will. Yeah. More example. Pretty not much better. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so here's the, the problem with the with the Richard Lucy algorithm. So taking my image, um, on my face as an example, um, where I just started, just a Gaussian Gaussian blur, um, and then I run this for multiple iterations in the reconstruction. So this is what it looks like after one iteration, after ten iterations, after hundred and a thousand iterations, um, and then I apply the PSF again. And after I've done this, I compare it again to the data. So, and then I compute those residual counts. So I just look like what's the difference between my prediction and the actual data. And as you can see here, like all these reconstructions here lead to more or less good residuals. But the point is here that they, that the prediction after the PSF convolution basically looks the same. While the reconstruction that I have before the PSF convolution looks very different. Um, and this is typically what's called like an imposed inverse problem. So there's no single unique solution to, to this. Um, how to deal with this? So historically, people just said like, oh yeah, I'll use Richards and Lucy and just iterate for 10 iterations because like when I as a human look at this, it looks plausible. Um, but there are ways to go beyond this. And the idea is really that you can use base theorem to the rescue for this. So the idea is to additionally include prior information because so you extend your uh, objective function here. So you have the log likelihood, which is just the possible likelihood. Then you have this additional log, log prior and then you compute the posterior distribution from, uh, from this. Typically humans, I think, are good with prior information. So here's an example. You can already tell this is somehow like an un unlikely image. It's just noise. Here's already some more structure, and you can say this is probably a more likely image. So if you have a log prior, then this kind of information should be somehow reflected by the, by the prior. And there you can say, okay, this is a likely image. So you would like to have a high probability for these this kind of structures, structures here. Um, a typical solution for this is just learning like a whole distribution of those um, using something like deep learning, for example. Um, in astronomy, this is a bit harder because there's not enough training data, like astronomical data is very rare and expensive to create, so you can just pull arbitrary data. We also don't have any ground truth. We just don't know what the real black distribution in the in the sky or the universe looks like because we can only observe it through, through our telescopes. And what typically remains um, is an approach similar to transform learning. So we're trying to learn the prior information from other data that we have available, or for example, for simulations. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Sorry, when it, since you're talking about deep learning, yeah. I think some yeah. people, this is not necessarily my opinion, but some people would ask, why don't you just use, like there are like deep learning networks that do image reconstruction already, right? Yeah. Just like yeah. encoders, auto encoders and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, why is that a bad idea? And just like in, in a broad sense of this case, yeah. other than like lack of interpretability. I think it's not necessarily a bad idea, um, but there are certain certain things to take into account. So I think the most important one is indeed prior information. So the sure. prior information that we have in this problem is the PSF. Mm -hmm. So we know the PSF. Um, in addition, we know the possible likelihood mm -hmm. as well. We just know that it is. And if you would just throw in like an arbitrary deep learning model in it, then this is all information that the yeah, network would need to learn yeah. first. So you can already guess you would need like higher computational um, resources to, to solve this. Um, in addition, we also know that, for example, the PSF with um, of, of Chandra changes a lot with the field of view. The same is true, for example, for, for Fermi um, as well. And also the network would need to deal with this somehow. So you would need to cover a large parameter space of PSF simulations, for example. Um, and this just makes it, I think, computationally very, very intense. And the idea is that you can put in this information that you know in advance, and do something else. Um, another topic that is important then in the end, and this is what we're going to discuss, I mean, you're also interested in errors and uncertainties. Right? Um, and this is for many machine learning models, not for all, but for many, this is unclear. Um, you could solve it with um, simulations of bootstrapping, but again, this is just like a huge computation. So I think this is probably the main thing. And just to add to that, um, uh, so 
people have actually done this thing for XMM, for example. Okay. Uh, there are uh, there is a deep learning uh, deep convolution which brings XMM images almost to Chandra quality. Mm -hmm. uh, but as you know, Axel pointed out, it takes a huge amount of uh, training and effort and everything. And I I'm sorry I don't mean to scoop you, Axel, but the important thing about this process is how you can combine data sets from many different <laughs> instruments, yeah. and that is pretty much impossible with deep learning. Or at least this afternoon. Uh, yeah, I mean, without spending, you know, you throw in a new instrument, new machine or something, it, yeah. it will take six months before you get to the point where you can actually use it. Mm -hmm. Whereas yeah. this is straightforward. Well, almost. Yes. I think there was an additional question in the, in the Zoom, or at least a raised hand or something. Was it there? Uh, no, I don't see it. Yes, it was mine actually, but we can go on and then we, we come back later. Okay, so, yeah. <laughs> As we're mentioning several instruments we can get images from, I was just wondering, like, are you kind of optimizing things separately for the like, like different instruments, and then you obtain like, multiple responsive images of the same thing, and you somehow yeah. combine them, or do you yeah. kind of take it to? No. Yeah, yeah. I can I can explain this. This is actually reflected here in the. So I work with a with a single posterior for all observations. And this is reflected here. So this sum here over the likelihoods, this is actually a sum over multiple observations. And this is what I call like the joint likelihood between multiple observations of the same, same thing. Um, so I'm only optimizing or reconstructing a single image from N observations, how many? Do you think that some images are actually more helpful than others and there's some way that you want to say? So... That's, this, this is definitely an open question. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I'll show show a few examples of the application vision later, but this is definitely a question to, to ask. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, actually, from Mon Yang from UCSB. So it looks like uh, yeah. the, the image you show different iteration is the smoothness of the the image uh, after you reconstruct. Is it uh, reasonable to put some like uh, Gaussian random field that type of prior to say your choose is sort of having certain smoothness? Because if you look at the first row, it just right that. Yeah. That's not considered. Yeah, so I mean, what's happened with Richards and Lucy here? So this, there's no prior assumption in Richards and Lucy, and what's happening is that actually the image here is decomposed into point sources, right? So like this, this battles over, over all. And indeed, I mean, the the way then to make progress there is to in, introduce some correlation. Um, mm -hmm. And people for Richards and Lucy have done this, right? So they included things, for example, um, like regularization. Um, or they've included something that you suggested, like a Gaussian local local correlation. Um, but I'll, I'll propose another solution to this, um, and this is called this patch-based image prior. Um, and this is something that was proposed actually for computer vision, so reconstruction of every, everyday images. But the overall idea is that indeed we have to, to reconstruct a more plausible image, and we have to take, take into account the local correlation between the, 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 the pixels. Um, but typically the structures that you have are not necessarily smooth. Um, in astronomy, you can have things like edges, you can have things like curves, you can have things like corners um, or like more point-like point -like features. And the main idea is that you can somehow learn the, the prior statistics or prior distribution from existing astronomical data that you have at other wave wavelengths that typically has better signal to noise ratio. So here are some example images, um, such as the JWST image of Cas A, um, or the Glade Gleam radio survey data. The problem there is you cannot just learn the whole image as a part. But typically, this is also not needed, because you're only interested like in, in local correlations between the pixels and not necessarily the global ones. So typically, a pixel in the upper left of the image is typically uncorrelated with the one in the, in the lower right. So you're typically just interested in the, in the neighborhood. Um, and one way to take this information into account is the idea that you split such an image in small in small patches of the size, typically eight by eight pixels. Um, and then from such an image, you get like millions of these patches. And then you train a Gaussian mixture model to represent the distribution of those, those patches. So if you have an eight by eight pixel image, then the, the Gaussian mixture model, model will be 64 dimensional. So for each pixel, you have a single, single dimension. And then you make a choice on the number of Gaussian mixture components that you have. Um, typically, I would use like 120, 28. 
And this is like well understood how we can train a Gaussian mixture model. So we can do this expectation maximization. And this you just do on these example images that you that you choose from. What happens after training is that Gaussian mixture models are typically used as clustering algorithms. And you can see that roughly the same thing is happening with these patches. So after training, you can see that these patches cluster for certain structures. So here you have something like this, this curve here, if you're like an edge-like edge thing, you maybe, I don't know, two points or so close by, something like this, and here's another curve. Um, I think this means, I think this was actually an example from everyday images. I think this is not one of the, the astronomical data, but this is typically, typically what's happening. What's nice about this is that we can actually evaluate the, uh, the probability of the Gaussian mixture model. We can evaluate it in, in closed form. Um, so this is again, very, very efficient. The initial idea was by Zoran et al. and done for everyday images. And then later this was adapted by Bauman et al. for the reconstruction of radio images from the Event Horizon Telescope. And just on Monday, there was what was a talk by Bill Friedman um, talking about this and then like an extension to this method already, but initially this was applied to HT T data. It's the black hole image. Yeah. Yes. You've seen it the black hole image. It's each now we can use this information in the Gaussian mixture model in the reconstruction process. So in the um, once we we minimize our uh, max or try to to actually estimate the maximum upper story um, estimation or doing a maximum upper story estimate, uh, estimation. And the way we do this is the following. So in the background you can see that this is the image that we would like to reconstruct. And then I split this image into a grid of overlapping patches. And then for each of those pa patches, I can evaluate the Gaussian mixture model. And then for each of these patches, I actually find the Gaussian mixture component, which is the most likely one. So I actually um, treat the the number, so um, or the, the number of the Gaussian mixture component, I treat it as a nuisance parameter in the problem set. And this is profiled out of the out of the likelihood. And then I sum up those best likelihood values for all patches. And this gives me something like a total um, prior for, for the whole image here. Um, if you do this on a more intuitive basis, then you can see that this Gaussian mixture model actually effectively works as a patch denoiser. So in the reconstruction process, um, the image like shows some structure, and then you find the structure that is most similar, or if you find the, the component that is most similar to this to, to the structure, and then the whole uh, optimization process is like pushed in that or draws the solutions towards. And this most likely component for each of those patches. And it makes, makes sense. And I end up in the end with a maximum upper story estimate for the reconstructed image. Mm -hmm. I have a question about the overlapping. Yes. Um, yes. Does the degree to which optimal you should overlap the patches depend on the structure of the image, or is there just a guideline that can always overlap? That's, that's basically a hyperparameter. So make a choice on this. Um, there, I relied on this initial paper by Zoyn et al, where they said, like, if you have a certain overlap, um, this gives the smoother reconstruction in the end, which to a certain degree makes sense. Otherwise, you would have like sharp, sharp edges. Um, and here, in this case, I think I just have an overlap of two pixels between the um, between the neighboring patches. Okay, then we wanted to put this algorithm to to a test, and we then came up with these test data sets. And instrument data um, or these test data sets, and then we consider multiple scenarios, source scenarios, and instrument scenarios. So here we just have a collection of point sources with a very bright one here, and like um, of bright isolated point sources in the upper right, and here like lower in the lower left, and they are like weak sources close by. Then there's another scenario with an extended source in the middle and surrounded by point sources. There's another scenario with point sources in this button shape here and then like a weak, weakly extended or extended but very weak source underneath. And then we have these jet-like features. This was interesting to see whether there are like any preferred directions for example, in the reconstruction. And then we have this scenario D, which is this spiral shape here and the string shape. Um, and again, there are neighboring point sources. So then we simulated some data with toy PSF or uh, Chandra scenario. So this is roughly what it would look like uh, if, if Chandra looked at these sources. And then the same for X and M, which has like much worse angular resolution. So you can see the image is much more blurred. And you cannot really resolve things like um, 
these point sources anymore that are here, or like all the point sources here in the lower left are just blurred. This now shows the, the comparison of this method, of the John Deacon method against a few standard solutions. So this is the data for scenario A1. Here's the ground truth. This is John Deco, but just using a uniform pie. So this is very similar to the Richards and Lucy reconstruction, iterating for 10, uh, 10 times, here 1,000 times. This is another algorithm um, that was created by the Charles group here like 20 years ago by now. I think. <laughs> called, uh, called, <laughs> that's called, it's called Europe, but it's a very, very nice thing. Yeah. And then this is the Johnny Deco reconstruction using the Gaussian mixture model that was provided by the, the original authors, which was trained on everyday images. And then there's another mixture model that I wrote on clean data. And this is shown to the triple line. You can see like that for point sources, like all of these algorithms do a reasonable job, um, at least for isolated ones. So they can basically recreate and reconstruct a point source where it should be. Um, however, of course, the problem gets more complex in the lower lower left here, where the point source that still are hard to confuse. Um, and basically, like all algorithms, let's say, break down in the, in the most lower left here. Um, but this was really just to challenge the, the, the algorithms and see um, or get like a qualitative comparison between those. Then if you take a look at scenario B3, um, so this is what the reconstruction looks like with the uniform price and 10 iterations. So this gives like a plausible Gaussian source in the middle and a half plausible um, Gaussian source here at these, these edges, but the point sources are still very, very extended. Then if you have this uniform prior with a thousand iterations, then you have exactly the same what's, what was happening with my face. So the extended source here is really decomposed into point source and all the correlation is lost. Um, Pylura can or Lira can correct to this to some degree. So this is already shows a bit more correlation. The Soren and Weiss prior here shows a result very similar to the one with the uh, 10 iterations here. And now with the Gleam one, you can actually see that it reconstructs those sources here nicely and it also keeps the point sources um, and like giving a very plausible image very close to the to the ground truth. And the same applies to these other scenarios. So again, like this. Jolly Deco with the Gleam prior here reconstructs those jet features. Um, it at least reconstructs the bright point sources, the very weak point sources on top of this X, that this is um, not, not visible. So indeed, there's there's a limit, limit to this, but it also reconstructs the, the spiral and the, and the ring shape here. Then we did the exercise of actually combining the data in the two data sets, so the Chandra and the XMM scenario just on this data set here, uh, the D1. <laughs> and this is what the data looks like for Chandra. This is what the data looks like for XMM. Um, so the color scale here is the same. So in XMM, you have much more counts, but you have a lower angular resolution. Um, and what we found is indeed that the Chandra data sets dominates in the, in the reconstruction. So the reconstruction of the joint well, the joint reconstruction here looks very similar to the Chandra reconstruction. But what we found indeed is that if you include this lower quality XMM data, low, lower quality meaning like with the worst angular resolution, and still if you include it, it either improves the result or it doesn't hurt it, at least. So we can take into account this, this information. It never makes the result worse. Um, and then especially if you also look, it, it also leads to further improvements. So this is the um, the case where the signal to noise ratio is very high. So this is like a very bright, bright source. And there on Chandra alone, you still have this effect that if you have these, these speckles here, um, just because the prior becomes very weak. Um, but in addition, once you take into account the XMM, actually those are gone. And you can actually reconstruct better the extended features. So what it creates is somehow like a merged image um, with like the positive qualities of both, both instruments, if that makes, makes sense. Um, this leaves aside systematics, so there are systematic errors to each um, instrument, so things like backgrounds, so for example, instruments can have background emission. Um, but this is just a purely statistical perspective. Yeah, uh, I have a question. This is really interesting. So. Uh, I think the uh, I, I have a question. So that the, the feature, how do you I mean in terms of detail, how do you determine the number of uh, feature? Because this really remind me of some like 
convolution neural naive had u net to detect the boundary and the stuff. So that mm -hmm. you may need a really large space or feature for right some complicated image. So then in your mixture model using the data, how do you like, how many kind of like a database you, you need and then how do you se select this feature to build uh, this? Yes, I can I can comment on this. So the the approach there is typically a bit ad hoc, let's say. So you just choose a number of Gaussian, or I would I would do something like this. So the like each Gaussian component corresponds to some feature, whatever that means in this. Uh, but you rely on the on the clustering um, properties of those. And typically you just choose those. I think the idea is rather that you like a Gaussian mixture model has the universal approximation property, right? So you can basically approximate any distribution using a Gaussian mixture model. And this is basically what you rely on. Um, I think in theory, you could do, I mean, you could probably find like the ideal number of Gaussian mixture components um, given some data set that you've learned the Gaussian mixture model on. But this is something that I did not, not really do. It's probably worth, worth an exercise and see like how the reconstruction changes with the um, with the number of Gaussian mixture components that you that you do because it could be like thirty two could be sixty four could be one hundred twenty eight could be ten, um, but I think in the end you just rely on the fact that you can basically model any distribution um, with the with the Gaussian mixture model, and especially if you have a large number of of, of components at the end because in the end you just evaluate the likelihood of the Gaussian mixture model. Then for this set of simulation, do you how do you uh, select those you know data to form your prior? Is it from the choose or is it from something else? For this for, for this data set, I use the one the prior that was learned from the Gleam data. So this is the data that I've shown um, here. So this is just the radio radio survey. There was no, I mean, you can probably adapt the choice of the data to your analysis problem, uh, but I was looking for something half generic, let's say, um, and I found this green radio survey data, which has like high signature noise ratio. Um, and I wanted a good coverage in the galactic plane because in the end I want to apply it to reconstruct morphological features, for example, of supernova remnants. Um, so this made made sense. But this is what is what is used in on these toy data sets as well. And in addition, I compared this to this Zoran Weiss prior, and this was learned on everyday images. So they Learned the Gaussian mixture model really on images of people, landscapes, dogs, cars, and, and everything else. Great, thank you. So the main takeaway here was really that you can combine like the positive um, features of these different observations. So here's an example of the algorithm applied to a source. Um, that is a supernova remnant. So this is the remnant of an explosion of a star. And what happens is that like all these ejecta move, move out and form this typically shell-like structure in the in the sky. This is what the rare data look or the raw data looks like. Um, so that's zoom A, so this region here. This is what the data looks like for C, zoom B, so there should be something in here. Um, and C, and this is the decomorph version using Jolly Deco. Um, you can see that it's a sharper image, it's also less noisy. Um, it is it sharpens across the edge here, but leaves the correlation along the edge. And I think this is important. Here, there is a putative point source that is barely visible, uh, but it really pops out in the after the decomposition here. And here you can see that there's some, supposedly some circular structure, for example, that is just not visible in the, or like only barely visible um, in, the raw, in the raw data. So here's a quick summary and a few ideas um, on what to do with this algorithm later. So it's a method for the joint like theory deconvolution of astronomical images in the presence of buzzer noise. It uses this patch base prior for the for the reconstructed to do the reconstruction of the flux. And you can really join multiple observations of the same region of the sky. And thereby it takes into account the individual response of each observation or each, each instrument. Both the patch prior as well as accounting for multiple observations lead really to an improvement of the reconstruction. So I think this is the most important takeaway here. And currently, Jolly Deco uses this maximum of a story approach. There's no particular reason why it shows this, except probably for computational reasons. So this is implemented all in PyTorch, and it relies then on PyTorch optimizers. So it's just like really convenient. But it would be very good to get um, some kind of error estimate and uncertainty from the likelihood function and the posterior. 
Um, so what would, for example, change to send a the posterior instead? But this is definitely future work. There are a few other ideas what one could do, like extending this very visible. So we plan to extend the method to the spectral dimension. So currently it only deals with images. But typically, in astronomy, we're also interested in how the images change with energy. And then another idea was to actually include multiple flux components. So not only having reconstructing a single image, but reconstructing, for example, two images at the same time, where one represents something like the flux from extended sources, and the other one, the flux from point sources. Um, in literature, it has been shown that something like this works. Uh, so it's something that could be, could be tried. And then there are other things like trying different approaches for modeling those, those patches. Um, but right now, I think we have not a really good reason to do this. Um, but this is the important one. So we'd like to get some help and ideas um, with getting uncertainties for the images. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions from the remote audience? Yes, oh, uh, yes Jeff Scarl has a has a hand raised. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, thanks a lot. This is really, really interesting stuff. Um, I guess I have two questions about possible extensions, and maybe you touched on one of them, but especially in um, in gamma rays, the point spread function is a very strong function of energy. Yeah. So your raw data is a set of times and energies. Is that something that's easy to account for? In principle, yes. Um, so this is what we what what, what we what we thought. But I mean, for Fermi data, indeed, like for example, the PSF varies by a factor of hundred. I think over the the whole energy range. Um, this is something that we neglected for now and just computed something like a mean pace f for a given given energy range. But what we plan to do was indeed instead of working with a single image, we would like to work with a cube. So a set of images varying very with energy, and then you can take into account for each of the energy bins the corresponding point spread function. But you need some solution then on the on the prior or correlation along the energy axis. Um, and then we started to collect some ideas, but we haven't, haven't decided on what to use. Um, then for time, I think there the important part is that typically, not necessarily, but typically the or based just from the, I mean, what we what what we're taking into account here is the instrumental um, correlation of the data, so the PSF and the um, so the angular resolution, energy resolution, the time resolution of instruments is typically so good that you neglect it. Um, so the measurements in time are typically independent. Um, so this is not necessarily then something that you would take into account in, let's say, like a 4D reconstruction. And um, so this you could always handle just with a loop over, um, loop over, over, over time, for example. Um, However, for example, if I go back to this image here, so this in fact includes 25 observations of Chandra. So I've taken the job like different across 25 observations, and they were all taken at different times. And once you take a look at the reconstruction and take a look at the residuals compared to the data for each of those observations, then you can actually see that the structure with time changed. And this is not something that I'm showing here. Um, but you could use it to detect, for example, change in the images on a more precise basis, let's say that. I mean, you would also probably already see it in the data, but it's less evident because the data is has a lower lower angular resolution. Okay, well, thanks. That actually, that talking about time is a lead into my second question. Of course, almost everything you you say here applies to one one dimension time series where you have yeah. time tag photons, and I I think there you need to be a little more careful about priors because. Often, especially in an exploratory situation, you're looking for, you don't know what you're looking for. You're looking for for sudden surprising events like uh, flares or transients. And so is there some sort of a general concept where you can tone down the importance of the um, the prior and and make it more generic than than you're talking about and and avoid missing um, strange things that you don't know about? That's a that's a good question. I mean, the so I have not much experience with with modeling of light curves. Um, I guess there are probably problems where you need to decode off the light curves in a certain certain way. Um, so like the whether you um, and I think that's probably what you what you're referring to. 
I think in general, this idea of this patch prior, I think is very general. Um, and there it mostly depends on like what kind of data do you use for the trading of the Gaussian mixture model. Um, my guess is, so I have not really done a systematic comparison of these different prior assumptions. I mean, there's just this qualitative or visual comparison between the one learned on everyday images um, and the one learned on the on the clean data. But I think technically the approach is very flexible. Um, and then I guess even for light curves, you could probably make a reasonable choice. Um, would just say, okay, I, you would learn this Gaussian mixture prior, you would learn it on from maybe simulated data. Uh, but then in the end, it's probably not good at detecting like animals or something like this, right? Because I mean, this is not really what it's made for. I guess like detecting out of distribution, I think is probably not the thing that it does well. I have, I have actually comment because I was just thinking about <laughs> this uh, transient events and, uh, you know, Sunday star image, Sandra image uh, taken over the course of few yeah. years. Yeah actually shows the uh, presence of the variable sources in the center. And I was wondering if you apply the method to the several of Chandra images of the galactic center, will you be able to identify the parts in this multiple images where you get this uh, additional events? We haven't thought about it. But we haven't really thought yeah. about it. I mean, the I think the benefit that you get with, with Jolly Deco is the higher angular resolution. Right, right. Um, and these regions are all confused. So, you know, if, if you yeah. know yeah. where the yeah. Southern star is, yeah. and you have all these other points. Yeah. Yeah. And you have maybe, yeah, maybe some, some chance, yeah. for example, of separating close, uh, close by point sources and then separating those on the information yeah. of the variability, for example, as well. Yeah. So you have like additional information. Very, very interesting <laughs> idea. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, maybe that's a good, uh, good uh, location. Okay, uh, more questions? Uh, Charlie? You... Yeah, yeah you... so thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes yeah. you can hear. Well, yeah. yeah, thank you, Axel. Um, I'm I just sending uh, on the chat a few a few uh, reference. Most likely you are already aware of the but trying to send to the students. The, the idea of using EM of the Bayesian reconstruction of image was really a big topic, you know, at the time, about 20, 30 years ago. There was, there was a very large literature in the in the statistical literature, and particularly this uh, this uh, Bernie Silverman's algorithm, they call it EMS. The idea was they realized when they run EM long enough, then the thing looks bad. But if they stop earlier, um, it would be better, essentially, the overfitting province. So they added what I think called it S, you know, the smooth step. And uh, so, um, it, you know, my general question is, um, is that the, uh, uh, you know, how much of that literature um, helps you to, you know, get to the best of what's already known and then deal with uh, what has not been addressed? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the, for, for the references. And just a side note that I have not mentioned, I mean, so with Jolly Deco, you overcome this problem of the early stopping. And so the examples that I've shown are, I mean, there's no, so we have not a, we have not a well-defined criterion um, for when to stop the iteration, but what I did was just like, I optimized long enough and um, like way longer than probably needed. Um, but this is a question then of like the computational resources. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then so like, how long can you afford it to run? Uh, but this is also like an open problem. I mean, you could find like what's a good way, uh, for example, when to stop. And for this, you could approach uh, use approaches from machine learning, things like cross validation or having a validation data set. Um, and this works because, or at least in cases where you have multiple observations, because you then can reshuffle the observations and just optimize on a subset and doing this cross validation. Um, I think the main focus here was to define, instead of a generic smoothness criterion, um, I think the idea was rather to work with a more plausible or realistic assumption on the, on the correlation of the, of the image pixels. Mm -hmm. um, and then really exploit this, this, this kind of information as much as possible. 
I would, I would say. Um, the original idea was from 2011, I think. So this was just before the deep learning <laughs> boom. Um, but I think there are definitely statistically like a few, probably still a few interesting ideas to be exploited um, from, from that time. Absolutely. So uh, how long does it run? How, how, what is it? the performance of the algorithm on this data set because this is like 25 or more data sets right yes yeah this this runs this runs for so for this i've used the gpu yeah um, and this runs for 20 minutes on the gpu yeah so that's very efficient and fast actually yeah yeah this is 25 observations and i think the image size is a thousand by a thousand pixels yeah and this runs on 20 minutes yeah uh fabrizia has a, has a question Yes, I have actually several questions. Uh, one is uh, it's not clear to me if you use uh, Poisson statistics uh, as it is, uh, as Poisson uh, told us, or if you use uh, the approximation from cash. Another question is, uh, do you use uh, a supervised or an unsupervised technique? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can start with this too. Yes. Um, so I use, I use cash statistics. Um, which, is not. which is the yeah cross log log likelihood, and um, so I don't use the full um, a full cross of cross of treatment. Um, I hope I think this answers your question, right? So I, I use cache, um, and then with the unsupervised, so Gaussian mixture models are unsupervised, and this is what I use here. But it's just important to keep in mind that I only use this to to learn the prior. And then the prior doing the reconstruction, so when I actually reconstruct the image that I'm interested in, this is fixed. So there's no additional optimization of the Gaussian mixture model here. So I really use this as a fixed, fixed prior, with the exception that I choose the most likely Gaussian mixture component. I've experimented a bit with, um, so instead of profiling the, um, the Gaussian mixture component, I've experimented a bit just with marginalizing, so summing over all Gaussian mixture components. I basically found identical results. Um, so it seems like there's one component that really dominates the, the likelihood. So for each patch in the image, you can find, find one Gaussian mixture component that is really close. In uh, which kind of uh, images uh, did, did you try this uh, technique? I mean, only on uh, Poisson images uh, like uh, uh, Chandra, uh, XMM and so on, or also on other kind like uh, radio observation? No, I have not. I have not tried it on radio observations. And um, this was the work that was basically done by by Bauman et al. Um, mm. So this is the reference here I'm I'm pointing to. So they they did this for for EHT data. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, my version is basic specifically for gamma ray and X-ray data, and this is the only data I'm trying to. I've also applied it to Fermi data. I'm, I'm not sure if there's uh, any example here. Yeah, you showed it at the beginning, and that uh, it comes to my mind uh, the application that was done by the people from information field theory mm -hmm. because yeah, 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 multi frequency uh, yeah, yeah, images. Yeah. So that's very nice and um, eventually to compare. But very nice. Thank you very much for this talk. Thanks for coming. Okay. Uh, we are well past our schedule. Yeah. Uh, so I should say thank you all for joining. Uh, I guess we'll we'll stop recording. <laughs>